Hello, my friends. My name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church, and it's a small country church in Lawrence. And dear friends, I come out here to, with my friends and fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord to bring to you the gospel message, to tell you about Jesus Christ. We're here to proclaim salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Friends, we're here to warn you about the, the coming judgment, to warn you about God's coming wrath, but to tell you that Christ is the shelter. He is the one in whom you can place your trust and he will not disappoint friends the text of scripture that i would like to look at is in romans chapter 1 beginning in verse 2 well i'll actually start at verse 1 to get a context the apostle paul says in verse 1 he says paul a bond servant of christ you, jesus brother. god bless you ma'am called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of god which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're ultimately out here to tell you, friends, is that there's peace in Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. In fact, we're here to, to proclaim to you the gospel of peace, the good tidings of peace. Friends, we're not out here for your destruction, but for your edification through the preaching of the gospel. We're out here for your good. We want you to have peace with God through Jesus Christ. In fact, listen to the words of the Nahum the prophet in Nahum chapter 1, verse 15. He says, Behold, on the, on the mountain, the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace. And friends, that's what we're here to do, announce peace through Jesus Christ. But friends, we're also here to give an indictment that if your sins are not atoned for through the, the saving blood and the effectual saving blood of Jesus Christ, then you will perish eternally. There only remains judgment and wrath for those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And so friends, I cry out to you this evening if the Spirit of God is going to be working on you as I preach the Gospel, I cry out to you to be reconciled to God through Christ, to be made right with your Creator. For now is the time, today is the day of salvation. Soon the offer of salvation will no longer be laid before you. Soon the offer of eternal life will be removed from, a, from before you, friends. And so we cry out to you in an urgent spirit, with urgency, concerning your souls. Sometimes I get so passionate. Yeah, yeah. But you can pull the mic away a bit further. Okay. Because it's a little bit... So the, yeah. Okay. Because I can adjust the volume here, so... Okay. So quite a sensitive mic, so Beanie. That's good. That's good. That way I don't, yeah. That's, That's clear. Clear. Brilliant. Okay, friends. Great. Thank you. We have high-tech equipment out here. Praise God for that. But friends, as I said, there's an urgency with this. There's an urgency when the Gospels preach because, friends, just in reality, 160,000 people die every day. That's a lot of people. In fact, many of them are your age. They fit into your age category. And friends, I don't want you to perish in hell if today is the day. I want you to, to be received into heavenly glory. And that's through the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I could give this text of scripture a title, I would title it the gospel of the Old Testament. The gospel of the Old Testament. Friends, the Old Testament scriptures and the new testify to this gospel truth. In fact, a lot of people will look at the Bible and they'll say that the Old Testament really doesn't talk much about the Gospel. But how foolish they are to make such an assumption. 
and how foolish they are to make such a proclamation because the Old Testament is laden with references to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is all about that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a further revelation of, of the reality of Jesus Christ coming. In fact, the Old Testament Scriptures is just a, is a, is a record of God's covenant dealings with the sons of men. First beginning with, with Abraham and then to Moses and then to David, all ultimately pointing to the coming Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, we even see a covenant promise given all the way in the garden. God promises to send the, the promised seed who would crush the head of the serpent. Friends, it's all about Jesus Christ. That was the subject matter of Paul's gospel, of the gospel according to the apostles, the gospel according to Peter and to James and to the writer of Hebrews, to the prophets, to Moses, to all of the writers of Scripture. The gospel message was about the seed. It was about Jesus Christ. That is where all salvation is found, only in Him. And so my friends, the question for you tonight is, do you have salvation in Jesus Christ? Do you understand that the Bible, both Old and New Testament, testifies to the glorious reality of the Gospel message? So just to give a little context to this verse, this is the opening of Paul's Gospel gospel presentation to the to the Romans in the book of Romans and he begins in verse 1 and describes who he is that he's set apart for the gospel that he's called as an apostle he's a doulos he's a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ friends are you a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ or are you a slave of your sin my friends when you become a slave of Christ then you are truly free and only then only then are you truly free from the power of sin and the effect of sin and the effect of, of unrighteousness and iniquity, only then are you truly free. For Jesus Himself said in John 8, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Friends, many of you are weighed down in the shackles of sin and are just simply awaiting the final day of sentencing. You are awaiting God's judgment. As the book of Hebrews says in chapter 2, verse 15, you're living in the fear of death. And friends, that fear is removed by Jesus Christ. And it's only removed in the message, by believing the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's look at this. Let's look at the gospel according to the Old Testament as the Apostle Paul puts that forth here. And he puts forth many other concepts, but that's really the first theme we see in verse 2. He says in verse 1 that he was set apart for the gospel in verse 2, which he prepared beforehand, or excuse me, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not some new thing. It wasn't something that God thought of on the spot. In fact, Scripture says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of of the world. In fact, there are so many places I could go to in the Old Testament that speak of the coming of Jesus Christ. I'll start just toward the end of the, the, the Old Testament in Daniel 7, when Daniel has a vision of the coming Jesus, uh, the coming Son of Man, the one who will be seated on the throne, exalted in heaven. Verse 13 of Daniel 7, Daniel says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven. One like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will never be destroyed. Friends, is your life's focus upon the glory of Jesus Christ? For that is what the prophets were focused upon. In fact, in a moment, I'm going to go over to, Dan, um, to the book of Isaiah and I'm going to walk through a couple of passages there and show you that the prophet Isaiah as well beheld the glory of Jesus Christ. And my friends, that is the essence of saving faith. See, friends, you have sinned against God. You have fallen short of the, the holy standard of your Creator. And therefore, you are consigned to the place of judgment. You are consigned to hellfire and without hope. But the Scripture says that God, being so rich in mercy, has put forth His Son 
as the sacrifice for sin, that Jesus Christ died for sinners and rose from the grave on the third day. He put away God's wrath against the elect. He drank the full fury of God's judgment and wrath against sin. Friends, is that what you're focused on? Is that what your hope is for heaven? Is it hinged upon Christ? Is it built upon Christ? Is it founded upon Christ? Can you sing in agreement with the, the hymn that your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness? Can you say that you would dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name? And friends, I do want to pause here and just say that if, if you want to ask a question or you have some questions concerning God or Scripture, then we actually have a microphone set up right here to my right hand. It's a very nice microphone, I will say. And friends, we'd be more than happy to, to attempt to answer your questions and to, as best we could, explain to you what God has to say concerning the question that you ask. So friends, the prophets all describe a coming Savior together as a, as a uniform testimony, as a uniform body proclaiming the coming of Christ. One of the most famous passages of this, of this gospel preaching in the Old Testament would be Isaiah 53. And there is so much that I could look at in this chapter. But simply, I want to look at just a few verses. Specifically in verse 4, I'll begin there and I'll go down a few verses. Listen to the way Isaiah describes the work of Jesus Christ. See, friends, because of our sin, we need someone to bear our sin for us or we're going to have to bear it ourselves. And we will be, we will be punished in hell for all eternity if someone does not step in. But not just someone, but God Himself. If God Himself does not come and intervene and save us, then we cannot be saved. And so Isaiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, predicts the coming of the sin-bearer, of the righteous Savior. In Isaiah 53, verse 4, it says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, and smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. My friends, Christ bore the sin of God's people so that they could be redeemed, that they could be forgiven, that He might purchase for them total, complete salvation. Friends, is this your hope of heaven? Are you tr or are you trusting in your religious performance and in going and seeing the priest or going and saying prayers or trying to read the Bible enough to make yourself right with God? My friends, prideful people will not inherit God's kingdom. Prideful, self-righteous people will not get, be given entrance into the kingdom. My friends, you must humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and trust alone in the work of Christ. Trust in the fact that He was, he was stretched upon the cross of Calvary. That God the Father unleashed upon Him the, fuel, fu the full fury of His judgment, the full fury of His wrath. And the Bible says in verse 10 of this chapter of Isaiah 53, it says, But Yahweh was pleased to crush Him. The father was satisfied in the death of his son. In other words, God treated him as if he has committed the sins that we have committed. As if he was a liar and a blasphemer. As if he himself was a, was a fornicator. As, a, as if he was a, an adulterer. As if he was a drunkard or a drug abuser. He treated Christ as if he had done those things. Though in fact he was innocent and perfect. The innocent dies for the guilty, the righteous for the unrighteous, the holy for the unholy, the pure for the impure. This is the gospel message that Christ atones for the sins of the elect. And friends, I, I, I am so grateful that I can report to you this evening that Jesus Christ not only died, but He rose from the grave. He defeated death. In fact, Scripture says death could not hold Him. It, it could not exercise power over Him. He is the resurrection and the life as, he, as John 11.25 states. He is the way, the truth, and the life as John 14.6 states. He is the true God and eternal life. Death cannot hold my King and my God. You know what's so profound is when we look and we survey the history of the world, we see 
in every generation there are religious leaders who will arise and will mislead many people will proclaim to have the truth in fact even in our in recent days in or I should say recent centuries there has been the advent of Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness cults and friends they claim to have the truth but their founders could not raise themselves from the dead Joseph Smith the founder of Mormonism could not save himself in the hour of death Charles Russell the founder of the Watchtower and Bible and Tract Society could not raise himself from death or perhaps one of the the more popular religious leaders who have ever lived Muhammad could not raise himself from the dead that's because the God that Muhammad preached was not any God at all but he was simply an idol scripture says that all of the gods of the peoples are idols in fact listen to the words of the psalmist in Psalm 115 it's quite profound really he says these words not to us O Lord not to us but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness and because of your truth why should the nation say where now is their God but our God is in the heavens he does whatever he pleases listen to this verse 4 their idols are silver and gold the work of men's hands they have mouths but they cannot speak they have eyes but they cannot see they have ears but they cannot hear they have noses but they cannot smell they have hands but they cannot feel they have feet but they cannot walk they cannot make a sound with their throat those who make them will become like them everyone who trusts in them friends if you worship a false God if you worship a a false God whom you've created in your own mind even if you call him the God of the Bible you will become like him you will become like that which you worship friends and if you worship a false God then you will just grow in iniquity and grow in sin my friends you must know the true God and he's he's accessed only through Jesus Christ this is exclusive this is the narrow way Jesus said broad is the path that leads to destruction in fact Jesus Christ more than any person in all of history preached offensively in fact he preached so offensively that he was ultimately killed for what he said and betrayed by his own people my friends we have so many preachers who will who will dare stand in pulpits in churches and preach a soft watered-down gospel preach a man-centered gospel and no mention of God's judgment or wrath no mention of the holiness of God no mention of the of the precious blood of the lamb but instead it's just this vain simple little moralistic tale of well God loves you and he has this wonderful plan for your life and he just wants you to come he's just waiting for you he's just yearning for you my friends the God of Scripture commands you to repent I don't want to ever take away from the mercy and compassion of God it is so true that God is compassionate but friends I don't want you to ever think that God is some cosmic grandfather who just distributes blessing all over the place to everyone don't believe in the God of the of the southerners because the God of the southerners is not a God at all you've got to trust in the God of Scripture you know my friends I was born and raised in the south I've lost my accent I, I lived in uh, different places for some periods of time so I actually lost my accent but I was born and raised in Lawrence and I was I was oftentimes exposed by the teaching of a lot of people who really should have spent more time studying Scripture than trying to teach it but I was exposed to this false God of the southerners friends don't trust in him he's not real the God of Scripture is the true God this God of Scripture who accomplishes eternal salvation in his son Jesus Christ that's the true God and the true God who who actually saves people from their sins so many people claim to be followers of the God of Scripture but they walk in absolute rebellion they walk in sin addiction to pornography and drunkenness and worldliness and they think themselves to be converted simply because they walked an aisle they said the prayer the preacher told them that they were saved friends that is foolishness let all who name the name of Jesus Christ depart from evil let all who confess him to be Lord depart from sin my friends I say this that you might be convicted and that you might truly be saved from your sins another such place in the Old Testament and I referenced it earlier I referenced it earlier is Genesis chapter 3 
And this is right after man has sinned. This is right after Adam has fall, uh, fallen short completely. He has transgressed the covenant of works. He has fallen short to the uttermost. And God promises in chapter 3 of Genesis these words. And He actually gives them to the serpent, the one who deceived Adam and Eve. But of course, this is still nonetheless God's promises. He says in verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between you, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the heel, or excuse me, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Friends, Christ is that fulfillment. He is the fulfillment of this text. In fact, uh, the promise is further explained and is, is, you could say, republished. You could say it's added on to in, elsewhere in Scripture. Specifically in Genesis 12, where God calls um, Abraham, He calls him out of the land of Ur, out of idolatry. And He says these words at the beginning of Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and, your, and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And, I, and the ones who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Friends, this ultimately was also fulfilled in Jesus Christ because He is the one. He is the seed of Abraham whom all the, the nations shall be blessed in. He is that one. Do you see how the Scriptures in a uniform chorus all testify? The, the various authors, the 44 authors of Scripture cry out in one accord together that Jesus Christ is Lord. So friends, let's go back to the text. Let's go back to Romans, where we were at uh, beginning. So he says in verse 2, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So we clearly understand that. And he continues in verse 3. Now listen to what is the content of the gospel. In other words, what is the gospel about? Well, verse 3 tells us succinctly. It says in verse 3, concerning His Son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Friends, the Gospel message is about Jesus Christ. The Gospel message is about Jesus Christ. Friends, this is so important because it seems to be that so many people have a self-centered, a self-focused philosophy and a self-focused outlook on life that it's ultimately about their good and their happiness their self-discovery their self-love their self-affirmation friends jesus says forget yourself and look to him jesus says in luke 9 if any man wishes to come after me he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it Whatever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Friends, you gain by losing. You win by dying because it's no longer about you. Your life is not about you. This life is not about you. It's not about me. It is about the glory of God. And that's why the gospel is about Jesus Christ. Verse 4, Who was declared the Son of God with power, by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. As I said earlier, praise be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ that not only did He die upon the cross, but He rose from the grave. And He is alive today. And He will never die again. And the Bible says He sits at the right hand of majesty on high, and He is exalted there, and He is there now, and He lives to make intercession for the people of God. He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. Friends, holiness. Holiness is what God possesses. It perfectly describes who He is. Utter moral perfection. In fact, Scripture describes it in Deuteronomy 4.24 that God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. In fact, in Nahum chapter 1, it says the Lord is a vengeful. It is true that God is kind and compassionate and God loves. We see that daily in our lives. Even this gorgeous weather tonight testifies to the love and mercy of God. But friends, God is so holy that He gives us His law. He publishes the covenant of works. And the problem 
lies not in the covenant itself, not in the commands. For the commandments are good. God says not to lie. That's good. God says not to steal. That's good. God says you shall not disobey your parents. That's good. God said that homosexuality is a sin. That's good. God said you shall not commit adultery. That's good. God said you shall not be deceitful. That's good, etc. You shall not blaspheme God. That's good. But the error, the issue lies in the fact that we ourselves, we ourselves have broken those commandments that we have fallen short of the covenant of works that we have fallen short of keeping the law in fact the scripture says that the law is by no means our means of justification it's by no means the way that we're going to be saved all we all the law does is show us our sin god's law is like a mirror it shows us how dirty we truly are and we need cleansing through jesus christ that's what it's for so many people look at the commandments and they say well i'm just going to try my best to be saved Friends, you cannot do it. Don't try such a futile thing. Don't try such a wasteful attempt. Instead, use the precious time you have to be reconciled to God. My friends, because of this law breaking, there is the sentencing of hell upon each and every one of us. We are all consigned to that place of torment. And we're all without hope in and of ourselves. You're wasting your time, Bob. Absolutely not, sir. Sorry, if you'd like to come have a, a conversation with me, we do have a microphone over here connected to the speaker. If you want to give a, a coherent argument. Or not. My friends. My friends, what's truly wasting your time, what's truly wasting your life, is living for this world, is living as a child of the devil, is indulging the passions and desires of the flesh. That is truly wasting your time. A good use of your time, the best use of your time, is to give God glory by coming to Him through Jesus, the Son of God, the Divine Savior. That is the best use of your time. Friends, so we are consigned to this place of torment without hope, but God being the God of grace and the God of abundant mercy, but never compromising His holiness and never compromising His, judge, uh, his justice and His judgment sends forth His Son, Jesus Christ, and who came and fulfilled the law, who keeps the commandments. Jesus fulfilled the law that we break, and then He goes and He is whipped and beat. He is mocked and He is, he is scourged. He is stretched upon the cross and He is, he is slain there as the, the Lamb of God. And He suffers under the wrath of Almighty God for all of the people of God. And He rose again from the grave. He defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated sin by never breaking the law. Fulfilled all righteousness. Never sinned once. And friends, 40 days later, He was exalted into heaven. He sits, sits there now on that throne. And what Jesus says is you must repent and believe the Gospel. Friends, you must flee your sins. You must turn. You must repent. And you must cling to Christ alone. You must cling to Christ for life eternal. You must not trust in your own selves and in your own religion. You must trust not in your, in your genealogies or your ancestors. You must trust not in anything you can do, but trust alone in the merit of Christ. God is jealous to get all the glory and salvation, friends. God is jealous to get all the glory and salvation. And He will not give His glory to anyone. He will not give His glory to another. He will not give His glory to men. And so salvation will never, has never, and can never be by work. It is by grace through faith we are saved. In fact, uh, 500 years ago, this year we're commemorating the 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. One of the greatest things to have ever happened in the history of the world. And one of, the, one of the, the terms that the reformers coined was sola fide, it's Latin for faith alone. It was, it was the fact that we are saved by God's grace and all we have to do is simply trust in that by faith. That is, herein lies salvation, herein lies eternal life, that you rest upon the merit of Christ alone by faith. And my friends, if you do that, God will forgive you of your sins. He will cleanse you of your rebellion. He will cleanse you of all of your pornography addiction and your drunkenness. He will cleanse you of all your sins. My friends, don't cling to your sins because God sees your sins. 
You may think that your wife does not see your internet history or your girlfriend does not see your internet history. God sees even what you're looking at with your eyes as you're out here downtown. Friends, God knows what's in the mind and what's in the heart. And they will all be brought into subjection one day and all brought into judgment. Friends, you must look to Christ. Look to Him. Look to Him alone. Friends, where else can you look? Where else can you find salvation? Nowhere else. Nowhere else. Scripture says He is the way of salvation. And friends, not only will God forgive you of your sin if you trust in Christ, not just forgiveness, but total perfect righteousness. God will wrap you in the righteousness of Christ. He will treat you as having lived Jesus' life. You must believe upon Christ. Scripture says, remember the Lord in your youth, young men. Remember Him in your youth. Don't waste your life. Even your lives are short. Scripture says your life is like a vapor of smoke. It appears for a moment, it's gone the next. Scripture says, remember the Lord in your youth. Trust on Christ. Trust on Christ, young men. Trust in Him alone for your eternal redemption. Don't lose your souls for your sins. Don't lose your souls for your pride. Do you realize how many people are going to go to hell for this one thing? Because they are so prideful and they are so self-confident and so self-righteous and so self-serving. Friends, Scripture says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He might exalt you at the proper time. Jesus said, blessed are those who are humble for they shall see God. That's astounding. What a promise that those who are humble shall see, they shall see the Almighty, the Most High God, the Creator, Yahweh Elohim, the One who made all things, the One who is from everlasting to everlasting, Almighty God. They will see God, those who are humble. My friends, ultimately there's two religions in the world. There are two religions in the world, friends. There is human accomplishment and divine accomplishment. Human accomplishment and divine accomplishment. Friends, which religion are you in? Are you in trusting in yourselves and in human accomplishment? Or are you resting on the righteousness of Christ? And friends, I do want to address those of you who claim to be Christians this evening. We're in the Bible Belt, so I know that in my midst there are many people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. You perhaps might have said the prayer or walked the aisle. Perhaps a preacher told you you were saved. Perhaps you wrote it down in your Bible. Friends, none of that matters. What matters is present fruitfulness. Are you a new creation? That's what it's about. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 16, that you will know true Christians by their fruit. And then He said it again four verses later in verse 20, that you will know genuine Christians by their fruit, by the way they live, by the way they talk, by the way they think by the way they behave, by their actions. That's how you'll know whether a true uh, someone is a true Christian or not. It's not whether you've had some ridiculous emotional experience in some Southern Baptist church. It's about life change. It's about being born again. Friends, do not lose your souls for your sins. Friends, I care about your souls. I care about where you're going to go when you die. For so many years of my life, I lived in hypocrisy, thinking myself to be a Christian, but I was never born again. I was never truly converted until God did a work in my heart. Friends, I just want for you genuine, true salvation. I don't want you to be eternally lost. I don't want you to be eternally damned. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. You have a good evening. My friends, we come out here out of love. We come out here because we love you and we care for your souls. Please do not die and go to hell. Do not lose your souls for your sin. Believe upon Christ alone. Believe upon Him and He will save you from your sins. Don't be so foolish as to waste your time, as to waste your life. Scripture says, For what would it profit a man if he gains a whole, the whole world and loses his own soul? In other words, what happens if you gain everything in the world, but you lose your soul? What does it profit you in the end? It profits you nothing. My friends, many of you are concerned about your cars and your clothing and your status in society and how much you make every year, your 401k and your retirement plans. Friends, that's not what this life is about. It all is going to burn up. It's all going to burn. Friends, this life is vain. It's about living for the eternal things, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 5 continues, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for His name's sake. Friends, we have received grace 
me and my brethren who are out here, we've received grace from Jesus Christ. God has saved us. And my friends, we want that same grace to be given to you this very evening. Did we not ourselves join in prayer? We joined in prayer for your souls before we even started because we trust that God will call His elect. Sir, God is not going to be mocked. Scripture says that God will not be mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap, dear friends. Even you young ones. I'm young too. I'm a millennial. I'm in one of the craziest generations I feel like has ever existed. Friends, but I want to address you, my fellow millennials. Don't live in foolishness. Don't live for this life. Don't live for this vain, fleeting passions of the flesh that are often presenting themselves before you. Live for the glory of Jesus Christ. That's why at the end of verse 5 he says that we are doing all this for His namesake, for to exalt the name of Jesus Christ, to put Him up high and exalted. My friends, this is what you ought to be living for. Do you know what the greatest most bigoted thing you can do today in America? Do you know what the most bigoted thing you can do today is say that Jesus is the only way to God? To say He is the only way of salvation? That is the most heretical, blasphemous, most bigoted, most hatred-filled thing you can say in the United States today. Because we live in a, a nation overrun by what's called postmodernism, which basically means you have your truth, I've got my truth, everybody's just got their own truth. Anybody can worship whatever God they want because they're all going to make it to God anyways. Friends, that is a lie straight at the pit of hell. Satan is the author of such a lie. Friends, Jesus is the only way and I will proclaim it even if it costs me my life. I will say this because it is true. For if you give up even just this most basic tenet of the Christian faith, you don't even have God. If you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. Friends, if you don't have the Son of God, Jesus Christ, you certainly do not have the Father. God bless you, sir. God bless you. You have a good evening. Oh, friends, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. And then in, hey, he continues in verse 6, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. We realize this too. God is sovereign in salvation, dear friends. We realize that God is absolutely sovereign in salvation and He will call to, the, to Christ those whom He wills. He will call to salvation those whom He chooses. Uh, Romans 9.16 says, For it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Friends, we trust in the sovereignty of God that God will bring His elect to saving faith this very day if He so chooses. And if not, then not. But we just come out here in obedience, trusting that God will draw those whom He desires to Christ. Do you have a question, sir? I do, actually. Do you mind using that microphone right there? Because it actually projects oh, the speaker. Oh my God, I would love the microphone. Okay, go ahead, fire away. All right, we got our first question asker. If you just give me your name and then you can fire away. My name is Drew Brown. Drew Brown, nice to meet you, yeah. Drew. So, I got a question. If you just go up a little closer to it. Oh, my bad. You're fine. So, Hey Steve, can you turn on the can microphone? I, can I hold it because I'm six foot six? Sure, go for it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, for some reason it's not going at the moment, so. Oh, well you can just ask uh, it out loud. Okay, I'll just ask you. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I thought it was running. But anyway. Go ahead. So mm -hmm. Jesus is projected to be the uh, of the lineage of King David. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only way that they trace his, his lineage is through his mother, or no, through his father Joseph, who was not in fact his father. Excuse me. Uh, well, his mother was also Jewish, but it was not from the lineage of King David, unless you trace it back through his father Joseph, who was not well, his father. Well, Joseph was his father in the sense that he was his earthly father. It, you could see it kind of like if she was a virgin. It wasn't actually his father. You could see it kind of like as a well, not in terms of conception. We know that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Yes, exactly. So she was his adopted father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's or you could but say almost is, in term like so, stepfather. But, so I have I have a stepmother who is not my actual mother, but I would. I wouldn't consider her my mother. I wouldn't consider me the lineage of my stepmother. Well, in a legal sense, yes. In a legal, that's why they even, um, that's, it's a legal term. It, it describes, and that's exactly what Joseph was to Jesus. It was his legal father. Yes, for sure. He was, but he wasn't his actual father, which is lineage. Do you know why? And do you want Lineage do, deals mm -hmm. with actual blood. Do you want to know why uh, <laughs> Jesus w was not technically the son of Joseph? And here's the reason why. Because she was a virgin. Well, yes, that why, but it even goes further than that. See, when we read Scripture, we need to read it in its original cultural context. Yes. And in Jewish culture, they believe that the sinful nature that we all have, we all have the sinful nature. 
is inherited by the father, th uh, through the father, I should say, through the father of the child. That's the way it was inherited. In fact, that's why you see when you they trace the line lineages, yes. it's through the fathers. But here's the thing. When Jesus comes along, his father, God the Father, begets him. And the Holy Spirit conceives, yes. and, and so, and it's and that has so much implication, especially in their culture, because he didn't inherit sin. He's sinless Son of God. Yes. Yeah. So. I, feel, I feel that, but at the same time, lineage by definition is who your actual family is. Mm -hmm. And if his family is not through <laughs> King David, his father, who's not in fact his father, his earthly again, father. Again, I was saying it's legal. And, it's and, illegal. And I, and I get that, but it's it's not by definition, is mm -hmm. what I'm saying. So it's, it's but the, the problem is if you're going to take everything literally, you have to take that literally mm -hmm. as well, not legally. Because legally is not literally. Mm -hmm. So are you a, are you a Christian? No, I'm agnostic. I've actually talked to this guy before. Yeah, you yeah. remember? Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah we've actually that. had some really good conversations. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, yeah, we have. Not an atheist, but agnostic. No, I'm agnostic because the, I I think everyone's actually agnostic. <laughs> okay. No Why one, is that? Because no one knows. Like you're saying, 100 percent. 100 percent. No one knows. I will I will claim that no one knows because the thing is, knowledge is something different than believing. You believe, correct? Absolutely. But you cannot say that you 100% know. Mm -hmm, I do. But you Scripture don't. says it. But that's not... Uh, it's it's, ver it's but, total... But that's and it's not, veracity. It's 100% it's accurate. But it's accurate. not. But it's not. That, that's... Oh, yeah. Thank you. I don't want to ruin your... <laughs> that's like... That's like... I don't... I mean, I can't... So, um, do you so, believe in... Do you believe in truth? Do I believe in truth? Mm-hmm. Hey guys, why don't you get on some shelves? Okay, yeah. You're gonna get wet here in a Let's minute. Let's do that. <laughs> it's gonna pass, hopefully. Yeah. Um, well, do you, if, if not, I'm going to the bar anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but, um, stuff, man. Thank you. God bless you, sir. You have a good evening. Let me ask. Let me ask you something, man. Yes, sir. I, I'm I'm a Christian, man, and you know I, I heard what you were saying, and you know I don't drink, I don't do drugs, man. But you know I'm homeless out here on the street, man. I can't even get a bed at the mission or the uh -huh. Salvation Army, man. And um. It's just, it's just rough, man. I come from Asheville, North Carolina, and, and it's just rough right oh, now. Oh, yeah, it's rough up there. Oh, I've been there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's rough right now, man. Um, and Do you know of any, are you familiar with any, there's a lot of local churches nearby. I'm sure it'd be loving, that'd be, if my church was closer, I would definitely help you. I'm all the way in Lawrence. Yeah. But it's like there is a man, lot, there, in, there's over a thousand churches here in Greenville yeah. County. And there's many, I'm sure, that'd be willing to help you. And uh, I mean, are you thirsty? I mean, I brought a water bottle. Actually, oh, I'm, I'm I always hungry. I've been eating all day, man. I'm just trying. You to sure? Just... Well, I mean, you can take this because I brought. I always bring an extra. I'm good, man. Well, people, good. there's there's a there's a pretty good amount of homeless people come here, and so I bring them with me to give out. Yeah. You sure? Yeah, I'm just trying to. Get it's some summer. It's July. Up. I'm just trying to get out this weather tonight, man. All right. What's going on, big man? How you doing, man? Pretty Are you a Christian, man? No, I'm agnostic. Oh, okay. Well, we're just having a conversation. Okay. I, I like, I love religion. All religions. I've read through the Bible, I've read through the Quran, I've read through a bunch of Buddhist uh, books. I've read the Communist Manifesto. That's not really religious, but. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> but I, I love the idea of religion and I, I like politics as well. It's just an interesting topic for me. But um, I accept the fact that I don't know if there's a God. What up? Because, I, like I was saying to him earlier, I, I honestly can't say anyone knows there's a God. Well, the scripture say, the scripture says in contradiction to what you say yes. that you do know there's a God, but, and you suppress that truth in your unrighteousness. But I disagree. But but that's what scripture says. But it, it's not. It doesn't even say that you believe. It says you know. But it, they have a, You have a knowledge of God. It's not a knowledge though. Absolutely. Because, no, it's not though. Well, do you believe in truth? I believe in the fact. I believe in the belief of truth. Is tr is, but do you believe in at like truth? I, I, if something's you're, you're oh yeah, saying. absolutely. What's up, bro? I'll be there in like twenty seconds. You try. I'll be there in like twenty seconds, Chad. You can you can come in too if you want. Okay. Yeah, you can come in and talk too. It's okay. well, I've just never seen. I always, I told her the other day. I said I've never seen you in a conversation. I wanted to watch it's her. Your conversation. You can join the conversation. I'm down with anyone. Well, the, the problem is. The problem is, what I believe is disprovable. You cannot, pr you cannot prove me wrong because I accept the fact that I don't know. 
proving. Oh no, I'm not. I'm not proving you wrong I'm, in the sense no, that you're saying it. But at the same time, you are hey. trying to because you're saying. Oh, I see. I, I see know. what you're saying. Yeah, I and, am trying and to prove you wrong. And the thing is, I'm saying I don't know. <laughs> and so it, it's. I mean, I, I, I'm He's not saying. I'm real. not trying to like make a big fucking scene. No, no. Here, here. I'll give you an example. I'll give you some. Here, here's how. Here's how I know you know. Do you need it? Is no, it no, it's, okay. it's my cousin. Okay. He's trying to get me to go like 20 steps down that way and it's straight. <laughs> my sister works at that bar. I'll be all right. I can get in. Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> Just the fact that you say you're agnostic is evidence that you know he exists. No, you know that is not true at all. Ag ag no, because agnostic means that I accept the fact that I...